This is the most serious thing I've read about the UFO disclosure ever. The list of crimes they presented in that conference, they make Al Capone look like Mickey Mouse. We're talking about things like treason against the United States, murder, mass murder, torture, bank fraud, money laundering, kidnapping, you name it. But depending on who did what, I can see at least two major defense contractors either go bankrupt or get nationalized under the weight of significant lit- litigation. And so people are buying the stocks of these companies and are taking on massive litigation risk after 80 years of crimes. Imagine spending an hour with the world's greatest traders. Imagine learning from their experiences, their successes, and their failures. Imagine no more. Welcome to Top Traders Unplugged, the place where you can learn from the best hedge fund managers in the world so you can take your manager due diligence or investment career to the next level. Before we begin today's conversation, remember to keep two things in mind. All the discussion we will have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their product before you make investment decisions. Here's your host, veteran hedge fund manager, Niels Kostrup Larsen. Welcome or welcome back to another conversation in our collection of podcast series that focuses on markets and investing from a number of different and fascinating perspectives. The father of quantum physics, Max Planck, famously said, when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. And for anyone that has made a long-term living from markets, that quote may resonate. You see, the investment and trading world is filled with big personalities that are often battling out dogmatic perspectives. It is also filled with an abundance of brilliant and curious minds that are open to expanding their horizons. In our Galactic Macro series, we seek to open the boundaries of what is possible. We do this by drawing from experts working at the bleeding edge of technology, science, environment, global conflict, exopolitics, exploration of outer space and inner space, and consciousness. A core theme that spans many of the conversations involves the growing government revelations regarding non-human intelligence from advanced civilizations. This core theme is fundamentally important because it weaves every other topic into its fold. You'll likely have more questions than answers after tuning into this series, but it's guaranteed that you will have changed the way you look at things and thus the things you look at will also have changed. And with that, please enjoy today's episode hosted by David Dole. Niels, thank you for the introduction. Nelson, pleasure to have you with us on the show today. How are you doing? Very well, David. Thank you. Glad to be here with you. So, Nelson, I would like to introduce you to to the audience. Um, Why don't we start with you sharing a little bit of background about where you grew up and how you got into the the fun, exciting investment world that we all uh, have made careers of? Sure. Um, I am the CIO of Raven Capital, uh, an investment manager out of Curaçao. I was born and raised in, uh, in Venezuela. Uh, we are at Raven Capital. We are value investors with a global macro overlay. I've been in the industry for two and a half decades. I have held leadership positions in various global banks and investment houses. And through my career, I have been, or I have allocated capital across regions, asset classes, and the capital structure. I am aware there is a lot of young people who want to break into this industry, who listen to this podcast. You know, my, my detailed job description won't be much use to them. So, so instead, I want to take this opportunity to talk to them and tell them about, you know, the three mentors that had a great impact on my career and highlight to them how important it is for them to have mentors in this industry. So I I started trading uh, commodities and and, uh, equities back in college out of my dorm. And uh, back then we had uh, a poker game going every week. 
And uh, the father of one of the regulars was a money manager. And uh, I told him what I was doing. And he, he, he invited me to his office. Uh, his name is Miguel. And uh, he invited me to his office and uh, showed me what he was doing. And uh, he was doing a lot of work back then, a lot of work with uh, chaos theory and the work of Edgar Peters. And uh, what I learned from this mentor is he introduced me to quantitative analysis and statistical methods and, you know, ta taught me how to handle data and, and how to clean it. And these are really important skills to have if you want to if you want to do this for a living. Back then, you know, I was young, I was getting started, and the easiest thing to do was to just to learn technical analysis. And it, it was where you would find the most books in your library, that sort of stuff. So learning about quantitative analysis, you know, blew my mind. And I realized, you know, how much I was not seeing from the picture, if you will. My second mentor, I uh, was a f fast forward a few years. I was already in my in my career. My second mentor is a uh, fellow trader. Uh, he's from Argentina. His name is Herman, and um, he he taught me about market structure and proper macro thinking. You know how to put the puzzle together, how to build a narrative that makes sense of the data. This is uh, another really important uh, skill that you want to develop if you, if you want to do this for a living. And uh, my third mentor uh, was my boss at the Distress Credit Prop Group, uh, you know, many years later. His name is Bruce. Uh, he taught me a great deal about, you know, proper fundamental analysis and deep, almost investigative journalism, you know, analysis of, of financial statements and all the insights that come from understanding what free cash flow is doing inside a company. So that's, you know, fundamental analysis is, is another leg of that stool uh, that I think is a very valuable skill uh, for all the young people uh, trying to br break into the industry and trying to learn from from this podcast, and so yeah, that's that's my background in a nutshell. That's that's fantastic, and that's a that's a very unique combination. And and one of the things that I'm always fascinated by with people's careers is there are some things that you find that are in in common um, that maybe even sound unusual. You know, for example, starting starting your career at a, at a poker table. Um, we find that a lot, you know, my own career was started playing dice, um, in street quarters. So it's funny that, you know, things related to, to gambling, uh, relate later to professional careers and, and managing portfolios, but that's super unique with the, somebody introducing you to, to chaos theory at, at such a, a, an early stage. What were some of your takeaways from, from being exposed to chaos theory? And, and have any of those things carried through to the way that you view the world today? This mentor, he was very gracious with me. He, uh, I, I, I was very lucky. He, he gave me a lot of, you know, I was a young guy in college. He gave me a lot of homework, you know, Excel homework. He gave me a lot of books to read. Uh, he would make space out of his week to talk about the things that I would, you know, that he was asking me to read and, and learn. And, uh, and, and really without going too deep into chaos theory, he was, he was using it to try to identify the trend and how long that trend was going to last, putting it in a nutshell. And he was using the concept of memory that Peters uh, outlines in his work, you know, uh, uh, trend slash data memory that he highlights in his work to try to figure this out. To be honest with you, it, it was not so much the chaos theory part of the work that I did with him that, that later served me a great deal. It was more the programming skills and the data analytics skills that I learned with him that, that really helped. Having said that, 
uh, chaos theory also uh, talks about the fractal, fractal nature of things. And uh, it, that jives very well with the fractal nature of the markets. And so eventually, while I learned other things, I found myself going back and saying, yeah, that clicks with what I learned uh, about chaos theory in the past. So that is, is, is regarding that. Regarding sort of the, the present time, w we look at the macro through the lens of the economic cycle at the firm. And this is a methodology I've developed over my whole career. Uh, so, so if listeners can imagine a sine wave oscillating around the x-axis of a chart, right? Let's say between minus one and plus one. Uh, this is a representation of the global economy alternating between growth and contraction. So, so if your listeners picture this in their mind, you will, you know, they will see that there are four stages. Uh, stage one is is when the the wave goes from the trough up to the zero line. That's called the recovery phase, and this is what happens after a recession. Stage two is when the wave moves from zero to the peak. This is the growth phase of the economy. Stage three is when it goes from the peak back down to the zero line, and this is what's called the late cycle which is the phase that we just uh, finished. And then stage four is when the wave goes back down from the zero line to the throw. And that's the recession uh, stage. Our work at Raven Capital shows that we entered stage four the second half of April of this year. And uh, we've been moving deeper and deeper into this, into this stage ever since. What this means is that all conditions for a recession to materialize have been met. The only obvious thing missing is, is the catalyst to light that fire. And what type of things, you know, maybe take us for a little lap around the world. You know, one of the conversation points that's, that's big, not just in macro, but for, for all portfolio managers, is the slowdown in China. Things going on in Japan, of course, is, as well. Why don't you share with us through through your lens, kind of take us around the the world in the way that you're seeing things, and perhaps share some of the the signs you're looking for that could be potential catalysts. Like what would be on your your radar as you look around the globe? So I'm I'm gonna what what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna tell you what the cat we think the catalyst is, and then we'll we'll go around the world because I think it's more useful. Uh, that way, because I don't think the catalyst out, is outside the U.S. <laughs> so we believe that the catalyst will prove to be the policy mistake that the Fed has already begun committing since three rate hikes ago. Uh, the last three ha rate hikes were not supported by the data, uh, by the inflation data, and especially the last one. Policy rate was far enough above inflation that by continuing to pause, the Fed would have still tightened. Uh, the U.S. economy grew year over year over, uh, you know, the last quarter, and inflation is arguably collapsing last 12 months period. So the, the right prescription for the U.S. was to, was for the Fed to continue to pause. Now, they didn't do that. Obviously, they continued to tighten. And, and not only that, but they, they are uh, using a very hawkish rhetoric. And, and, and we believe that the root of this, mis this policy mistake is that the Fed is underestimating what Milton Friedman called the long and variable lags of monetary policy. Uh, the Fed thinks, in, in, in simple terms, the Fed thinks the economy is, is stronger than it will ultimately prove to be. The Fed has been raising rates for 17 months now, okay? And we know from the work of, of Friedman that this long and variable lags average about 16 months. So, so if you think about this, we're only beginning to see the effects of the first few hikes that are already in the pipeline, right? And furthermore, the Fed has been raising rates throughout those 17 months. <laughs> so, so, so 
to make matters even worse, we know from the work of Friedman that the lag itself has a variability of between six and 29 months. That's a huge range of uncertainty to be as cavalier with hawkishness as the Fed currently is. And by the way, in Europe, the policy mistake is even worse because they have declining growth over there. That's sort of our big picture thesis. You know, I'll be completely honest with you and the audience. Forecasting recessions is one of the hardest things that human beings embark on, as, as we have seen by the last, you know, 18 months of forecast. Forecasting the duration and the depth of the recession are 10x harder than that. And, and the reason for that is because recessions are not linear processes. The, the truth is, after a recession, the economy rearranges itself depending on, on, the, on the conditions, the technology conditions, the productivity conditions, the uh, you know, contracts that are agreed, the prices, the quantities, the malinvestment. All this stuff gets rearranged. And not always, it's not always measurable. It's not always obvious at the surface. So it's only after the recession really gets ignited that you start to see, you know, where, where the stuff is under the surface. For now, if you ask me, the hawkishness is so intense that I think the, the, they will continue to hike and they will make this even worse. Because we, we see over the last you know, three, four months, how we've gone deeper and deeper into the recession stage by rates being as high as they are already. So, um, you know, I don't want to use the word hard landing again because of what I said earlier, but uh, this is also what affects the long and variable lags variability. You know, we don't know what's under the surface until it's, it starts to ignite. And what are your views on, you know, the United States debt to GDP is just continued to, to skyrocket. There was a chart circulating yesterday showing that, you know, we're now number four in the world as, you know, developed countries, Japan, Greece, Italy, and then, you know, the United States. How do you see that unfolding? You know, we're definitely in, in a lot of uncertain territory. The debt is just piling on with, you know, practically reckless abandon. Uh, what are your what are your views on that, and what are the implications for for the United States? And you know, if we enter a recession with such you know huge debt loads, how, how do you see that? So the debt load for our process was a factor that limits, or is a factor that limits how much the Fed can raise rates without causing a recession. That's the way we view it. And they have raised rates well beyond what 120, 125% debt to GDP really allows. That's why we are entering into the recession stage. The economy cannot handle 7 to 8% mortgage rates, you know, whatever 8% car loan rates, student loans rates that, you know, are in the also close to the 8 to 9% range and 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 the debt load is is the indicator that tells you how far the 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 fed can go now in terms of debt to gdp look we 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 know we know what's going on in japan uh and we have other examples across the world that debt to the gdp the, the the absolute number is not the problem the problem is the confidence of the market in your ability to maintain that number and still service your debt, right? So, so you know, in the extreme case of Japan, I don't know, we started talking about debt to the G GDP in Japan when I was first started, you know, starting my career. And we have talked about it throughout my whole career. But nobody has really thought that, that Japan would, you know, stop servicing their debt. The moment that occurs is when we have a, a real problem and when, and when debt to GDP really matters. 
I don't, I, I just, you know, at 125% or 120% debt to GDP in the U.S., I don't see it as a, 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 a as a factor that's going to collapse the economy or, you know, some sort of, I, I don't see that as a trigger. Uh, yes, it's high. Yes, it's, it was lower before. It's been as high as it is not now in, in previous occasions uh, around World War II. But no, nobody really believes the U.S. is not, not good for their debt yet. So I wouldn't lose sleep over it. Yeah, you know, say, same with me. I, I, I think we started our careers around, you know, the similar period. And uh, shorting Japanese treasuries is the famous widowmaker trade in, in macro, right? Like n- nobody's, nobody's gotten that right yet. And it's difficult to know even with the, the yield curve control and, and now giving a little bit more space for those treasuries to rise up to 100 basis points, how that's going to play out. Japan's certainly a, uh, a fascinating, fascinating uh, place and, and, and economic experiment there. How do you see, you know, one of the things I want to touch on with you, and, and this is going to be a big part of our, our conversation that I want to share with audiences as we delve into Latin America. Um, but before we get there, because there's some relationship to that, how do you see China unfolding underneath uh, the Chinese Communist Party as it, as it currently stands? Because there's there's obviously been a lot of implications for that. There's a lot of change in capital flows as they move over to Mexico, out of China, and to to other places. And I was curious to get your your opinion. How do you see the next you know decade unfolding for for China as, as it currently stands, since they're such a big market player? Yeah, um, let let me talk about the short term and the long term. Uh, in the short term, we hear a lot. Over, especially over the last few weeks, about how China is slowing down and, you know, oh my God, everything is going to collapse. China grew, you know, 6.3% Q2. And a year ago, it was growing at 0.4%. You know, and inflation is arguably under control in China. So the picture in China is a picture of, in the short term, of, yeah, well, maybe growth is. I think maybe growth is disappointing the street a little bit, maybe because they have too much of an overweight on Chinese equities and people are a little bit mad that the data didn't come out stronger. But, you know, if if we just look at what's happening with growth there over last year and what's happening with inflation, the right prescription is for China not, not, not to do anything right now, not to be really overstimulating the economy as the street is expecting. I just believe that the street things that the stimulus is needed for their long positions in, in, in Chinese equities to pay. The negative negativity over the last two years coming out of China has created value. There are some names that are trading below intrinsic value. And as you know, we are, we are value investors. And so we, we are monitoring a few names there that, that we think offer value. We have peace. We don't, we don't have any intervention in Taiwan and none of that stuff unravels the geopolitical stuff. China doesn't become the the main arms supplier to Russia, you know, out in the open, things like that. I think I think we can model along and and, and uh, the scenario is rosy. Over the long term, the more we isolate China, the more aggressive and I understand this is a chicken and egg thing because uh, at the same time China is sort of acting in a way that warrants a reaction. But the more we push them into a corner, the harder things get for them, the more they will behave like a corner beast. And the more the nightmares that we have about China might materialize. So I actually welcome the small efforts to try to defuse tensions that we've seen from the U.S. administration over the last, you know, handful of months. Uh, because the alternative is going to push these guys into the, uh, you know, into the wrong uh, set of decisions. Yeah, there's a there's a fascinating book. I don't know if you've uh, read it, but uh, "Destined for War: Can America uh, and China Escape Through Cities uh, Trap?" by uh, Graham Allison, which is is interesting and, and points to a lot of what you're saying. Is that we have to be conscientious of not pushing somebody into a corner. 
um, because it will provoke reactions and and it will accelerate you know hostilities. Have you read any of uh, of Graham Allison's uh, work? It's pretty pretty I ha- interesting. I have not, but I'm writing it down as you speak because I, I I'm definitely going to be reading that. Yeah, you 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 would enjoy it for sure. It's it's uh, it's interesting stuff. We find ourselves in a you know in a world where there's a lot of conversation concern. You know, as we've talked about with you know with debt and you know different polarization. And one of the questions that I'm sure you must get all the time, we hear it constantly, the narrative is, is, is pumped through the media, is the conversation about the BRICS. So I'd be remiss not to, to bring that up as a topic to, to allow you to, to, to comment on, why don't you share with the audience your, your view on the, on the BRICS uh, taking over the monetary system and, and, and your views on that? Yeah, I've been vocal about it a little bit, right? Um, let me answer that breaking it in two pieces. The advent of social media has translated into evil geniuses realizing that they can help their positions by buying social media influencers and, dare I say, reporters as well and media personalities. And so we find ourselves in a world now where increasingly smart money is trying to influence retail investors to join their trades through social media influencers. In other words, to influence them without knowing they're being influenced. Now we we track this this guys and we've spent a lot of effort putting them in their, their respective buckets and really understanding what they're trying to do in social media. So the first thing I want I want people to know is that a lot of this BRICS narrative is being manufactured by people who have an interest in the dollar going down. That's number one. Number two is let's talk about the BRICS itself. Some of the language I will be using will sound harsh, but it's just reality. The dollar is the reserve currency of the world because the United States offers the global marketplace things like rule of law, uh, things like respect for individual liberties, things like a rules-based financial system, things like, like I said, respect for private property, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is a set of attributes that make global capital feel safe in the United States, okay? Now, we're talking about honestly earned, legal, clean capital. The BRICS and all the nations joining, joining that, that group, if you, if you go through them and you, and you take the time to, to really understand each one of those countries, basically the people who rule these this nations are people who, in order to continue to rule these nations, have to curtail every single thing that the U.S. offers global capital. And so who feels safe moving their life savings to Russia or to China, who can change the rules overnight, right? You, you be visiting your local bank there in, in one of these countries, and then be arrested suddenly because you look suspicious because, because you know, of your passport or whatever. So th- this sort of stuff is very, the, the sort of stuff, the sort of security that the United States offers global capital is going to be very difficult to nearly impossible for these countries to provide to the global marketplace without relinquishing power, the ruling class relinquishing power. So what I'm trying to say here is that fade the social media uh, campaigns. The truth is no currency backed by the BRICS or put together by the BRICS will ever substitute the U.S. dollar. If you want to substitute the U.S. dollar as the reserve currency of the world, you have to offer more freedom, more security, more rule of law, more respect for private enterprise and private property. And you have to wrap all that around a, a, an, even, an even bigger uh, military force to protect all of that. 
that's just not going to happen. The only thing that will bring down uh, the U.S. dollar as reserve currency of the world is either something new that is not currently on the map rising, I, I mean another power, more benevolent power, or the U.S. collapsing from within. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of work being done from inside the U.S. to help bring that about. But uh, hopefully these people will fail at what they're trying to do. Nelson, you mentioned something that really caught my attention, and, and I wasn't aware that you were doing this, and it makes sense that you would be, though, is the, the tracking the social media uh, kind of profiles and personalities that are, that are pushing these narratives um, ben Hunt uh, from Epsilon Theory has been very vocal about, you know, narratives being shaped through through social media. And one of the things that that I noticed, and I'm curious to to get your view on this, is that, look, the story about BRICS is that that's one of those ones that comes and goes, it comes and goes. It's been around for a while. And this time, this this kind of last round felt different. It did feel and was very apparent that it was going viral on media and it did feel that that narrative was being more orchestrated and 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 pushed. Is that your sense? You know, I didn't track you know social people a, at all. But and one who who do you think is behind that? Is that a combination of sovereign state actors and you know people with you know trading their books? And so it's kind of two part question. One who who have you kind of identified behind that as 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 a group? And second, do you think that any of that is crossing into to criminal criminal activity, right? Like front running in macro is a little bit more difficult. It's not like front running in stocks. You know, if you're front running, uh, you know, currency devaluation, that's not really a thing that's illegal. But what are your what are your views on how other governments may react to to that, including the the United States? Yeah, you have a lot of interesting questions. Let me know if I miss one of them when answering. Criminal activity, absolutely. Uh, if the FBI were to contact me and ask me, I would provide the the the, the accounts that we track. Who are they? Uh, to me, it's very clear that it's U.S. dollar shorts. Now, when I say U.S. dollar shorts, I'm not talking about governments necessarily. I'm talking about actors in the financial uh, world, people who are short the U.S. dollar in size. I think that the government actors of these countries are just jumping in the bandwagon. They literally woke up one day and realized, holy smokes, look at all the people that are all of a sudden negative on the dollar. This is exactly what we need. Be why? Because remember that these corrupt uh, rulers from all these BRIC nations, they basically have a problem with the dollar system because in a U.S. dollar uh, dominated financial system, their assets can be frozen, you know, their their movements can be tracked and all this stuff. That's really the the the, the reason they hate the dollar is is really because uh, sorry, the dollar system is because it messes with their corruption. And so they're just jumping in the bandwagon and and trying to, you know, make something out of nothing. And uh, and so I don't think it's them necessarily promoting this. Although I guess after a while they have uh, also uh, uh, tried to promote it, you know, doing this 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 press conferences and this the summits and you know there is some media that that's out there that you can tell is from them, but they're not the main players. Uh, and 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 we should talk about why why the people who are pushing this narrative are short the dollar, and and the, the there is two reasons for this that we sort of identified, the or, or, or two groups. The first is a group of people who, who might believe like us that the global economy is just about to enter recession and the Fed is going to have to, the Fed and the rest of the you know, global central banks, but the Fed is going to have to cut rates and that's going to weaken the dollar. Uh, and so they have that trade on. And then there's a, another group of people who are this uh, dollar bear sl slash commodity bulls perennial commodity bulls that, you know, also have that trade. That's, that's how we, we think those groups are organized or who these players are. You know, I think one of the things that this, this speaks to that at least 
comes out of the conversation to to me, and I think is a, is a sign of career professionals is adaptability, right? So what what you're talking about is something that wasn't around when our career started, and yet it's a it's a new way of looking at at markets and influence and things that are that are feeding into to flows and decisions and everything else. And I think it might be worth touching on that, especially for whether it's, you know, existing professionals or people that are starting their, their careers, that element of always, you know, kind of massaging it and, and adapting to new scenarios, I think is relevant and, and important and curious as to, to how you, how you think about that, because clearly you do it. Um, but what's your thought process behind that? One of the things that we heard from our clients a year ago, 18 months ago, was, hey, um, everybody seems to calling for a recession. Why are we, meaning Raven Capital, not calling for it? And I, you know, especially to our New York clients, I would explain the, what I explained earlier in the conversation about the economic cycle. We're not there yet. But it was also a period of time where those questions help made, make evident that everybody in social media, and, and, and when I say everybody, I'm literally talking about the guy who is jobless and tweeting from the basement of his mother's house, uh, putting out information about the upcoming recession. Th- there's a couple things about that that struck us. The first is when I started my career what, in the two recessions that I lived early, early on my career. You know, these were things that we talk about in the confines of a trading floor where there was a massive information asymmetry versus the rest of the public. And so conversations would inevitably steer towards, oh my God, you know, the average person doesn't know what's coming down the pipeline. This is horrific, you know, whatever uh, we would say. And now we move to an era where somebody who has absolutely no real understanding of financial markets, market structure, macroeconomics, you know, company balance sheets, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, is, is, has 300,000 followers and is pounding the table about the upcoming recession. And so this, this has created a situation where you can have markets sell off a lot in a short period of time or, you know, a lot in a medium period of time like we had in 2022 because everybody believes there's a recession coming and is being retweeted thousands of times in, into, uh, you know, in, in social media. And so one of the things that told us that we should stick to our internal forecast of the recession is not here yet is the fact that everybody, including the guys who tweet from their mother's basement, was convinced that recession was coming. So what I'm trying to say is that there, there is a, a contrarian signal you know, embedded in this situation. There is also a, a great deal of information that has been made public in the social media era that used to be the domain of, of or really the, the elite of the, of the trading and investing world. And that has, I think, caused, you know, versions of front running uh, both to the upside and the downside whenever that's coming. But, but I think this, this crowd should be faded and you should, you should think about it as a, as a contrarian indicator. They're aggregate, okay? Not not what somebody says in a particular day or a week. And that's a good segue into some of the crowd's, you know, opinions about Latin America, which which we see even from professionals, has been a very popular uh, investment this year. And I think this is just a, a fantastic opportunity, you know, somebody that grew up in the, the region to to share some views as to h- how do you see Latin America and in, in your framework for, for navigating it? Right. So, uh, you know, as I said earlier, we are we're value investors with a macro overlay, right? So my my experience in the macro 
basically is used to keep us out of trouble. But at the end of the day, we are looking into individual assets and really diving deep into individual assets in order to add them to our portfolio. So we, we are not like a lot of people in social media, they trade in the macro, right? You see a lot of that in, the, in social media. We're really focused on individual companies. I say that as a, as a framework because despite being from the region, and as I said earlier, I was born and raised in Venezuela, despite spending a chunk of my career investing in the region, these days, LATAM represents uh, less than 2% of our portfolio. And the reason for this, or the reasons for this are, you know, no, number one, the region just does not produce the kind of high quality companies that we invest in. So, so by default, it rarely shows up in our radar. Uh, when we are looking for these companies, LATAM companies just don't show up. And that says a little bit about the average quality of the average Latin company, right? Uh, it's a little bit like the Russell, you know, people say, oh, the Russell is so cheap versus mega cap, you know? Yeah. But have you look at the quality of the Russell components, you know, it's absolute junk what's in there. The second reason is we look for companies that are able to grow intrinsic value over time. And I think. You know, outside of maybe Mercado Libre, companies in the region have not been able to create long-term value for shareholders. You know, they behave more like bomb, boom and boss assets, uh, cyclical assets. And that is in great part due to the hostile environment they operate in. By the way, Mercado Libre is, is, is famous for actually being able to, to navigate and circumvent this environment uh, massively successfully. Uh, and they take pride in it as well. So, uh, so we think there is, there is better risk to reward elsewhere. If, if, if I cannot buy an asset and that asset be able to grow intrinsic value over time, then I'm just, I'm just playing the, the wiggles. And that's just not what we do. I'm not playing for, for 5% or, or 10% or 20%. I'm trying to make multiples of my investment over time. And so that's, that's a second factor. And maybe you, you would ask me, you know, well, Nelson, what, why is this happening? Why is it that, that companies in the region are, 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 you know, the region is not producing high quality companies. And why is it that they're not able to over long periods of time grow their uh, intrinsic value? And look, in, in one word, I would say it's the culture. And, uh, you know, LATAM is a region that is extremely collectivist, extremely religious, and extremely authoritarian. And that combination, you know, of those three factors, you know, that's kryptonite for innovation, entrepreneurship, and wealth creation. You know, you might, you might have a country that has one of those traits and still do well, but, you know, to have all three, it's just... It's, it's a toxic combination. These are the things that people from Latin America, and, and I, I, I include myself in this, these are the things that we need to work on if we, if we want to attract capital, progress, create wealth, and, uh, and prosperity for the, for the citizens of the region. And it's a hard job. And I'm happy to, to explain why each one of these things are toxic, but that's a secondary uh, element, but yeah, that's that, that's my view on a lot of time. Yeah, it's been a challenge, you know, as a um, you know as a foreigner that lives in 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 Latin America uh, a big chunk of the year myself. It's frustrating and heartbreaking sometimes because you see a lot of talent, um, you see the 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 system that a lot of entrepreneurs are are up against, and you know, for those that don't speak Spanish, Mercado Libre literally translates to you know free market. Um, not a coincidence that they, uh, that they, that they name themselves that, um, and that's really the spirit with which they, uh, have taken that company, uh, forward. And we're, we're seeing, I, I want to, you know, as we've, we've got the, uh, time running down, I want to touch on just one last thing, because I do think that it is potentially game changing for the, the area is Argentina. I want to touch on Argentina 
And then I want to turn to to one of my favorite topics, which is is UAP and um, some of our conversations that you and I have had on that. Because you're the you're the first investment manager that I ever spoke to uh, about that. So maybe you could just touch very quickly on what's taking place in Argentina for those that don't know and and the potential there. Let's take two minutes on that, and then let's let's turn to to UAP afterwards. Yeah. So I mean. You might not like the package that it comes in, but the guys that we, meaning the global community uh, and global investors, need to support in Latin America are the guys who are talking less about collectivism. Bolsonaro was one guy in Brazil. Milei is, is the guy who is doing so in Argentina. These are, these are the guys who are going to lower the levels of collectivism, lower the le- by 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 default, then lower the levels of authoritarianism in these countries and of an improving rule of law and all this stuff. You might not like the package, but these are the antimatter of the matter that we have, and 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 in Latin America, and what we have in Latin America is not working. It's not working, you know? So, so a guy who comes on stage and says, I want less government, I want more free markets, you know, I want more rule of law. These are the guys that we have to support. And so I leave it to, to, to people individually to think about that. What I will say is that politically speaking, the left is global in nature and the right is local in nature. And so the left has a huge media advantage over the right because the right believes that everything that happens outside their borders is not their problem. So a lot of the stuff that we read in the media about who really, for example, Millet is, is just crap. And it's just stuff that the left is manufacturing globally in tandem together to make sure that Latin America remains uh, controlled by them. And so there's a bigger war going on, you know, than, than melee policies. Uh, but yeah, I think these are the guys we want to, we want to support if, if, if we want to see a different Latin America and they might not get everything right at once. We might need multiple guys like this to come over and build on the work of the previous guy. But if they never get to power, we're just going to keep getting the same result. You make an interesting point that I think also a lot of people may not be aware of um, if they don't spend or, or, you know, come from the region is that um, indeed the the media house of, of socialism is very, very strong and it's quite sophisticated down here. And, and it does tell a, they're a lot better at telling um, their global, their global story. Well, with that, let's Let's take our remaining time. I, I want to talk. It's actually great timing, you know, for the recording of this. So, we, you know, we're recording here. It's August 23rd. And just yesterday in U.S. Congress, Tim Burchett and several other members of Congress, including uh, Anna Polina Luna and Jared Moskowitz, they just sent a letter. And this is just wild stuff to me. It's, it's why I'm, I'm, I'm so fascinated with the, the topic. I think that it's, it's relative to macro. It's why we've got this series, you know, uh, tongue-in-cheek uh, title, Galactic Macro, is that we actually have, from congressmen and women, a letter to the uh, intelligence community inspector general demanding information on UAP. And for, for those that maybe this is the first time they're listening to the to the podcast, that's that's unidentified anomalous phenomenon. And in, in simple terms, UFOs. And what's been alleged over the last you know month with testimonies in front of Congress is that not only does the United States know what they are, but we have them. And this letter quite literally is asking for information on UAP ca- uh, crash retrieval programs. And in addition to that, we had passed in the, in the Senate, the UAP Disclosure Act, which mentions non-human intelligence 22 times. This is something straight out of, of a sci-fi movie. And, um, and as I was saying earlier, Nelson, you're the very first person I talked to as, you know, as a colleague in, in an investing space and, um, on this very subject, which I, I know fascinates you as well. What's your view as to, to what's going on and, and, and what do you think is going to play out here? 
Yeah. So, you know, as a fellow, I guess, Gen X, or we, we, you know, you, we grew up with Star Wars and we grew up with, you know, TV series like V, you know, so we, we are, we are obviously more open perhaps than, than other generations to, to, to consider these things. Uh, I tell you the, the level of disclosure and the speed with which disclosure is taking place at the high levels of government has forced me to move from somebody who consider who, who, who consider this something interesting to keep an eye on and and that enjoyed following it you know like most people I'm sure are listening enjoy watching the show and the ancient aliens and things like that to somebody who actually needs to start thinking and considering these things to fulfill his fiduciary responsibility with his investors. And, you know, I won't tell you that I am extremely advanced in how far uh, my understanding of the phenomenon is, and I'm, you know, the number one in it or anything like that. But I tell you, I've, I have put together a thesis and I'm working on that thesis and you know, as evidence come in and, and further disclosure or contact takes place, I will I will be looking to build upon that thesis. And that thesis basically has, uh, right now, as of right now, it has three legs. The first one is, and, and again, some of this, this is still a work in progress, so some of this stuff that you're going to hear might be hard to prove or, or, or things like that, but we are dealing with a subject that subject matter that we just don't have all the pieces of evidence yet. So the, the first thing is, is the deflation. It, it doesn't matter if they are coming from another galaxy, another dimension, from inside our planet. It, it is clear that these are a more technologically advanced race. So any peaceful, and I highlight strongly the word peaceful, and I put it on their quotes, and I draw a big circle around it in red. Any peaceful contact implies transfer of technology. Outside of unemployment and antimatter, technology is the most deflationary force in the universe. Think about the quantum leaps we could make or we would make in energy production, in space mining, in food production, in medicine, we could see decades of deflation or at least disinflation. So that's part one of the thesis. Part two is perhaps less friendly, is guns. In my country, we have a saying. The saying is, it's not the same thing to call the devil than to see him walk in the door. What that means is we don't know how a relationship between, you know, an alien race and humans will evolve. Historically on Earth, the track record is not very good. There has never been a contact between a more evolved and a less evolved civilization on planet Earth without eventually some shots being fired. You know, so if you think about it, a city is like a microcosm of a state. A state is a microcosm of a country. A country is a microcosm of a planet. So I think it follows that our planet must be a microcosm of the universe. So here on Earth, we have good people and we have bad people. The notion that everybody out there in the universe is good just seems naive to me. So I, I, I think upon further disclosure or actual contact, people will arm themselves to protect their families, and that has obvious implications for gun manufacturers. And then the third, the third leg of the thesis is legal, legal chaos for defense contractors. You know, one of the things that came out of uh, Stephen Greer's National Press Club Disclosure uh, Press Conference this past June is that a big legal team has been assembled by Victim families, and I'm going to again underline the word victim. I want to put it on quotations, draw a big circle around it. 
victim families to help prosecute RICO crimes related to UFO cover-ups. This is the most serious thing I've read about the UFO disclosure ever. The list of crimes they presented in that conference, and I told this to you, they make Al Capone look like Mickey Mouse. We're talking about things like treason against the United States, murder, mass murder, torture, bank fraud, money laundering, kidnapping, you name it. The list is too long right now for me to remember, and it goes on and on and on. But depending on who did what, I can see at least two major defense contractors either go bankrupt or get nationalized under the weight of significant litigation. And so people are buying the stocks of these companies and are taking on massive litigation risk after 80 years of crimes. Yes. And you know what? I think that's a good that's a good stopping point um, because we're coming up right here on the the top of the the hour. But this is a conversation that I look forward to continuing because I think those are just profound, profound points. And Nelson, I want to thank you for for coming on the show today. And we will definitely need to do a second episode to follow on with this. Thanks for being with us. And um, and Niels, we'll turn this back over to you. Thank you so much, Nelson and David, for an insightful conversation on a quite diverse range of topics. The importance of having great mentors is an important point that Nelson brought up, especially for our younger listeners. And I also enjoyed the connection between care theory and trend following because this is not discussed very often. It was good to understand Nelson's reasoning for why he thinks we are in stage four of his sine wave description of the global economy and what he believes was the catalyst for taking us there. But of course, the conversation heated up towards the end with his views on the BRICS and the social media influencers promoting this agenda. And to top this off was his work in progress theory about UAPs and the fact that a couple of the really big US defense contractors could be at significant risk in terms of legal risk. What I also thought was very important was the fact that Nelson mentioned that even if allocators of capital are on the fence when it comes to UAPs or trend following for that matter, they do have a fiduciary responsibility to be open-minded and investigate these topics. And with the cliffhanger we were left with, that is it for today. Make sure you go and follow Nelson's and David's work because, as you can tell from today's conversation, there are many ways to look at things and sometimes we need to change our worldview and we certainly look forward to challenging your worldview as our series continue. From David and me, thanks ever so much for listening. We look forward to being back with you on the next episode. And in the meantime, take care of yourself and take care of each other. Thanks for listening to Top Traders Unplugged. If you feel you learned something of value from today's episode, the best way to stay updated is to go on over to iTunes and subscribe to the show so that you'll be sure to get all the new episodes as they're released. We have some amazing guests lined up for you. And to ensure our show continues to grow, please leave us an honest rating and review in iTunes. It only takes a minute and it's the best way to show us you love the podcast. We'll see you next time on Top Traders Unplugged.